sweet Margaret. Hello. Little Ewoks. An entire empire brought to its knees by small furry creatures. That's my point exactly. Leave him alone. I am from beyond. Listen, and all you desire will be yours. Welcome to Spider Down and the Secret Wars. Prepare for battle. Side in a clone wars. Hello, and we're back for the second part of our Clone Wars on Caravan of Courage and the Battle for Endor. We've spent more, almost an hour talking about Caravan of Courage, and we've still got another film to talk about, and still to compare them as well and see what is the best of the worst, if there's even a trophy for something like that. Um, so I'm back here with Angry Andy Reviews. And uh, off, off air, you were saying that maybe we've been a little unnecessarily harsh on these films. Um, you know, people out there might may enjoy them and may have watched them as a kid and have fond memories. And, you know, more power, yeah. to, more power to you. You know, if you like them, you like them. But we as adults, re-watching and watching them for the first time, did not enjoy them. <laughs> no, no. I feel like we, we just need to just need to be clear on that. We're, we're not we're not crapping on these because no. it's you know it's popular, it's a good thing to do. There's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of people out there that will do it for the sake of doing it. But yeah, again, we're gonna literally, talk- literally say something's rubbish just to get views or opinions or whatever. We're we're being we're being very analytical, we're being very critical, we're being we're really, really looking at it to try and find some elements of positivity. And I have said, like, my main elements of positivity are the things they've uplifted from these stories into main canon. And there's, there's, there's one particular thing in here, which I, I do think uh, in Battle for Endor, that I do think is responsible for creating some really good characters that we see uh, later on in the Clone Wars specifically. And one of my favourite characters, I think, is directly descended from a character in Battle for Endor. Oh, we'll definitely we'll definitely get to that because I I, <clears throat> I like those set of characters that you're talking about. Um, that have, have I'm because I'm going through the Clone Wars uh, animated yeah. show on Disney Plus at the <clears throat> moment, and I've gotten to that point, and I really really enjoy those characters. I think it's some of the best stuff within the Clone Wars. You know, there's a lot of silly things as well. You know, like R two D. Oh yeah. R2-D2 going for a spa day, you know? <laughs> that's just like it. That. I mean, that's just it. I mean, the, the Clone Wars is a, you know, it's it's a, a much-loved animation series, um, but that has some horrific episodes in it. Absolutely. You know, Most it's of not them... all sunshine and roses. Some of them are awful. Yeah. Like, like Star Trek Next Generation, some of the episodes are purely filler and absolutely awful, and the pacing doesn't work. You know, you get it with everything. You get it with everything. But with these films, yeah, it's just it's it's not good. No, it's not, they're, not, they're not good. They they are the worst. They are the probably the worst Star Wars thing I've ever seen. I I will say I've, I I have not seen the holiday special in full. <clears throat> I've seen clips of it, but I've never actually bothered to watch it. But currently, yeah. these are the worst Star Wars things I've I've. I'd ever say seen. I'd say if you can find. If you, can, if you can find the holiday special, I would watch it just to see the sheer, unmitigated, poorly made decisions. You know, just the decision to do it. It's just so it's so poor, mm. so poor. It's 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 like watching a theatre show completely collapse. You know, in every way you can possibly imagine. It's just mess. It's a disaster. It doesn't hit tonally at all. Kind of like these films. They just don't hit tonally yeah. at all. My my one positive takeaway from this, it's really nice. It's actually a really nice part of the story. Um, director Joe Johnston, fans will know as the director of The Rocketeer, the director of The Wolfman, um, and the director of Captain America, The First Avenger, got his start with Lucasfilm and was on set for Raiders, Indiana Jones. And he helped, as a, I think he was a production designer, he helped create the world of Endor and the Ewoks. Um, and even wrote some children's books about it. Um, so he was fully involved in these films, fully involved in Return of the Jedi and previous Lucas films as well. But it was his 
like Endor was kind of his baby. Um, you know, obviously Lucas was like, yeah, we're going to create this, but he's gone, right, I'm going to fully immerse myself and create that world. And he did that. Um, and then after this film, Lucas said, you know what? You should go to film school. And he went, all right, I will. And then Lucas went, and I'm going to pay for it. So well, Lucas- that's just it. A lot of people cut their teeth on these features, on these films. Um, like I said, the music is really good. You know, the score is really good. The set designs are really good. The setting, the matte paintings that make the backdrop, they're really, really good. It's the last time you really see stop motion used in such a in such a way in these films. You know, it's that in itself is something that you should treasure really because this is like it shows the dying of you know the Ray Harryhausen kind of way of filming ethics and things like that with preacher effects and stuff like that. It's a shift from that into further practical effects and modeling and using animatronics, you know, that we see not long after, in less than 10 years, we see them with Jurassic Park and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So you can see you can see the shifts and you can see the building of people's careers here. You know, and we're not we're not saying we're not saying that you know it's all bad and it stems from you know the creatives and whatever. Yes, in terms of writing, I think George Lucas is probably at fault for a lot of this but the the honesty of the filming and some of the techniques you know they are they are quite good it's just the final execution be it editing direction you know oh, it's, it's there's, a, there's a multitude there's a multitude yeah. of problems um yeah. but what you were saying about people cutting their teeth on these films is apparently it was kind of a lot of a lot of people at Lucasfilm and ILM I believe didn't have much experience on set or or on any production so they this was yeah. this was almost entirely a kind of work experience project both of these yeah. films yeah, um, definitely. and it and it does show a little yeah um, it does. you know it does, it does reek of like university filmmaking you know, like Film school, film school kind of filmmaking, you know, where it's, it's rough around the edges to a fault. You know, it does have those things. But then, like with a lot of film school films, they do have little quirks and charms. Yeah, I just think it's. And I think it was. I think it was a good platform because, again, it's TV. There's less budget. There's less. Uh, possibility of failure and the this first caravan of courage was not a failure it was watched by millions the ratings were yeah. huge huge m- numbers it brought in the, it, uh, this- had, it had a, it had a very small theatrical like full cinematic release in germany for uh, quite a few weeks and it made money it was making money and that's the thing that people latched on to the ideas of the ewoks so when you say oh the ewoks were rubbish back then people loved them yeah. they loved them they liked the idea of the ewoks I've I've got a question for you, Andy. I know you're talking about the Clone Wars and some of the episodes. Now I, I've turned off the Clone Wars recently after uh, Jar Jar basically has sex with like a Bollywood alien. Um, that was that was when I kind of, oh like, god they made they made Jar Jar a romantic lead in the story. And Mace Windu's yeah. like, what the hell am I doing here? And I was like, no, I'm gonna t- I, I I think I'm not gonna watch any Clone Wars because uh, because the second episode there was a second part to it, and I was like, oh no, nah, I can't do it. So I turned it off for the time being. I am <clears> gonna go back to it. Uh, but my question for you, Andy, is in a par- in a parallel world, we didn't get Ewok movies. We got two Jar Jar Binks movies. Would you have rather have watched those or this? That's my question to you. I'd w- rather watch these purely because Jar Jar talks too much. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and and the Ewoks, are pr- like we said, they're hardened warriors. They're good. They're skillful. Um, Jar Jar Binks is a fucking idiot. You know, I know, yeah. I know. I know he gets a lot of stick, and you know, spaced. You know, we're a fan of uh, the TV show Spaced, and they. I think they put it best when they were like, you know, the Ewoks are shaft compared to Jar Jar Binks. You know. Yeah. And, and Jar Jar, like, you, like we, you can explain Wicket's silliness in Return of the Jedi because he's only he's only a youngster, so he's they literally they literally crafted Wicket as being the, the age of um Warwick Davis at the time. So he, he's a he's he's a, he's a baby. He's still he's no he's, he's still he's still a young child, but he does have that warrior instinct as well because he does carry a spear around. You know, with Jar Jar, he comes from a warrior race as well. These are warriors. The, the the people of Naboo were terrified of the Gungans because they could appear out of water at any point. They could travel through the cracks of the in in the earth, you know, the the caverns and you know just appear up and surround them and do, use guerrilla tactics. But Jar Jar, as a character, completely undermines 
the feel of the Gungans. So the Gungans were, were probably like, you know, the Phantom Menaces equivalent to, you know, the, the Ewoks in Return of the Jedi. But because of Jar Jar's complete ineptitude and stupidity, you don't you don't get the effect. And you don't feel sad that loads of Gungans die either. And I, that's that's annoying. So even even in the face of battle, when Jar Jar's, you know, accidentally destroying tanks left, right and centre, you know, in the battle in the Battle of Endor in Return of the Jedi, you see Wicket, you know, trying to mimic what other people are doing and, you know, hurting himself or whatever, but he never gets in the way. He doesn't get in the way and he doesn't take away from the fact that Ewoks do get killed. Mm. And there's a really sad moment in it as well oh, when God, you see yeah. an ATSD blow on the way. And I remember crying actually really? when I watched it when I was a child. And that, that Ewok rolls over and tries to wake his friend up, and then there's just nothing. That's really sad. And you don't get any of that in Phantom Menace because it's all about Jar Jar. Yeah. Well, so Jar, Jar, Jar Jar for me is so dangerous. Like, like I know they re kind of they rewrote he, he, it. Yeah, Jar Jar is the reason the war continues. <laughs> he's the reason the Clone Wars happens. So he's he's directly responsible for the Empire taking over, which is why all those theories about him being a secret Sith Lord are quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like, and that's through his stupidity and his is you know his ineptitude, like you said, and his naivete as well. Yeah. Cause yeah. all the Palpatine problems. manipulates him perfectly. That's why we've talked about it before. Like yeah. watching the prequels now as an adult. I like them more than I did when I was younger, purely because of Palpatine. I can see the inner workings of Ian McDermott's characterization, the little flares of looks and glances that he does in those films. Brilliant, brilliant, because you can see him manipulating characters, and I love it. Yeah, it's just, I, I, I couldn't watch. Uh, those, those episodes you talk about in The Clone Wars with Jar Jar, mm. I zoned out completely. Yeah. I can't even remember what happens in them, and I love The Clone Wars series. Yeah. I, I just can't. I, I know the actor gets a lot of stick and he's he's struggled with. I'm at best. Yeah, yeah. he shouldn't. He, he did what he was told to do. Again, a product of direction and writing. Yeah. He was told he was he did what he was told to do, and a lot of the actors that worked with him said he was brilliant. So that's why they, they, all the actors that worked with him, like Ewan McGregor and um, Liam Neeson, they hold him in extremely high regard because of his professionalism, because of the way he got into a character. Yeah. And we we didn't really see that in the films. No. Again, I think I think it's a it's a poor character, poorly poorly created, poorly, you know. Again, he's doing the actor is doing what he's told. He's been told by the director do this, and he's doing it to the best of his ability. So I feel bad for him that you know maybe his career didn't take off the way he thought it might, or that he might get more roles. And I know he was, uh, I think he had some suicidal moments, uh, which which is which yeah, is awful. Freddie, it's bloody heartbreaking. Yeah. But he's been been brought back into the fold of like you know Star Wars. He's, he's done a couple of on, on Disney Plus. There's like um. I think it's Disney Plus anyway. There's like a Jedi training academy, you know, like kind of like Crystal Maze kind of show okay. for kids. And he's the lead of that. He lead, he's dressed up as a Jedi, and he, he's you know he's he look he looks he, he looks good. He looks fit and healthy, mm. and he looks like he's enjoying himself. And I think you know, what 1999, mm. 22 years. It's a long time for him to you know. Deal they should they should have just brought him back in something and you know have him feature more prominently as a different character. I yeah, I, I just uh, for me, Jar Jar is everything he does is by accident. Whether it's yeah. whether it's a positive thing or it's a negative thing, and and the negative ones cause a lot of deaths and a lot of you know a lot of problems for them. And yeah. it, and you can't really and, and like if you had somebody you're working with somebody like that or you have somebody on your team like that, eventually you're going to go. I don't think it's worth it in a way to have someone this potentially good and bad, but more. You know, one day it could go so bad that the fucking planet explodes and and we're all done for. But yeah, I, I just don't like. Again, I don't. I like the Ewoks, and I think we've talked about why they're cool, why they're different. That this warrior race, that these can, you know, they'll eat humans. You know, don't fuck with the Ewoks. They will. They will eat you. I went down a particularly dark Ewok YouTube hole the other day. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later and kind of some of the stuff. But yeah. you know, they will. They will eat a stormtrooper. And they will eat a human. They will eat. Yeah, well, they were, they were going. They were going to eat Luke Han and Chewbacca. And, and they, the Jedi. they were going to eat them. Yeah, <laughs> plain and simple. We're going to cook them and then we're going to eat them. Exactly, and that's you know, obviously we like we're like, oh, it's cutesy, cutesy, cutesy. Um, but yeah, they were going to eat them. Speaking of dark, let's talk about Battle for Endor. So, so initially, this film, um, George Lucas again got the same guys back together pretty much. I think there's new directors or a different team of directors, yeah. but I think everything else was pretty much the same. Um, Lucas said, um, so off the back of the last one. 
his daughter, that who he made it for, was quite upset that one of the Ewoks died. Um, so there was an Ewok fatality at the end um, to save Sindel and Mace and the parents and everything. Um, so she was quite upset by that. So he mm. went, he went, okay, no more Ewok deaths in this one. No Ewok deaths. However, he still went, I want to make this film about death because yeah. the last one was was based on Goldilocks and the Three Bears. This one is apparently based on Heidi, which is a, a young girl um, living, like, a, you know, a orphan girl living with a, you know, a likable curmudgeon of an old man. So you see that yeah. in the film. But he was like, I want it to be all about death. Credit credit to this film. It does open with a bang. You know, there's a battle. Oh, yeah. You know, and it, and it's, it, it's, a lot, it's a lot more action-orientated, a lot more frantic, this one, compared to the last one. Last one was more ponderous and more sort of like, yeah. you know, let's think about it, let's talk about it. This one kind of just gets going immediately. Yeah, it's kind of, it was a bit more introspective, the last one. It's more like the journey and stuff. And yeah. So we get this battle. We get all these guys randomly turn up. Um, these kind of a- these aliens that l- live in a castle, as you mentioned prior. Um, Another castle. <laughs> and I think it's I think the villain's called Terak. I want to say Terak. Um, yeah, something like that. Yeah. And he's played by the guy who in the 1990s played Lurch in the Adams Family. That's the same yes. actor. And uh, and yeah, he, he basically just starts off with a bang. You've got all these people. You've got um, a witch called Caral or Charal, I think her name yeah. is. She's involved, and they're looking for a power, a power. So uh, the the like you said, we we've recast. The dad has been recast, um, and he's trying to fi- fix the space cruiser that crash landed in the last film. Um, and he has, a, and they're after the power, the power, um, and the power happens to be like the the battery uh, or the power source. Yeah, for, so, some some kind of power source from the ship. Yeah, it's a. It's a I believe it holds mystical powers and all this. Yeah, so they're after that, and they take that, and in in the ensuing battle, everybody dies. All the humans die. Yeah. Uh, apart from the little Sindel, who who Wicket saves and takes off. How did you feel about going from the the previous ending, which as I've gone <laughs> over, I fucking hate, to yeah. go straight into this, and all the human characters they they built up, you know, this big story, and like, oh, we're we're happy, and and then. <laughs> They're dead. Yeah, I mean, just to put it in that perspective, literally, Caravan of Courage ends with the family reunited and they're going to go away and fix the ship and they'll live happily ever after. Within five minutes, the family is completely obliterated, literally completely obliterated. You see uh, Sindel's running around and she sees Mace basically just shielding his already dead mother at this point Mm. from blaster fire. And he's literally just hammering as many of these, I'm going to call them orcs, because they look like orcs, yeah. as many of these orcs as he can. And he tells Sindel to run. Probably the best bit of Mace's acting, Eric Walker, you know, probably the best bit we see of Eric Walker as Mace. You know, it's he, his screen time is 33 seconds in this film. That is it. And all we see of him, he's already he's got like a couple of cuts on his face, so he's bleeding. And he just turns around and he goes, run, just run. I'll hold them off as much as I can. And you see him just hammering down fire. He drags away the mother into a bit of shelter, a bit of cover. And then it blows up and he's dead. And you know he's dead because they're both, they're, all the family are wearing these bracelets that have like a heartbeat sensor on them. And you know he's dead because Sindel looks at hers and it's flashing green and then it flashes red. Yeah. And, and he's I'm... gone. They're all dead. And yeah. literally there is, there's no sort of stopping to sort of say, oh, okay, why? Because the next scene... Sindel finds her father, and again, her father just goes, run, just run. And he does the same thing, tries to hold them off, and is killed immediately. It, it doesn't quite fit for me, because of the ending of Caravan of Courage, to have them all be so completely and a bit pointlessly massacred yeah. straight away. I mean, you see, you see these marauders like attacking the Ewok village and taking away Ewoks and carting them up. And my question is, why were the marauders not carting away these humans? Because if they're using them for slaves, you would have thought, okay, the humans would be better slaves because they're bigger, stronger. Mm. Yeah, it's all. And maybe they could be used. Maybe they can explain this power source that we're looking for. Uh, I just, I, I don't know why the decision was made to massacre the family. I really don't. Because I immediately, the, yeah. it threw me out immediately because I went, Okay, I'm all for twists and turns, but why have you done this after the ending of Caravan of Courage? Mm. It doesn't fit. And these are only a year apart, probably not even that, mm. in terms of release. <laughs> it's very it's very abrupt as well. Like, yeah. like Mace, Mace gets killed, but I, I had to rewind it because I was like, 
because she goes, he's dead. And I'm like, is he? Because yeah. even the shot, so he he picks up his mum's body, who's clearly not the same actress. <laughs> yeah, you don't you don't see her face. You don't see no. her face. The, the, the mother's obviously a stunt a stunt woman. Yeah. Um uh, carries the, and the body. Dad, the dad's completely different. Yeah. So Ma- it's only it's only Mason Sindel that the same actors and Warwick Davis as well. Hmm. They're the only they're the only same characters from Caravan of Coverage yeah. that we know yeah. of. Probably some of the Ewoks as well, like but. Oh yeah, yeah. I imagine. I know that um you know the the little person from um, Bad Santa. Oh yeah, yeah, he's in it, isn't he? Yeah, he plays one of the yeah. Ewoks as well. Um, yeah. Now, yeah, we see Mace take take. You know, he's firing his blaster. He was very fond of his blaster in the last film, and he's carrying his mum into the hut. And then there's a couple of blasts and a couple of explosions, and the aliens are, you know, the orcs we'll call them, um, are shooting. But it's never like. There's never a shot, an identifying shot to say that they've shot that hut. Yeah. It's, it's just it's, an explosion. It's, yeah, it's a distant shot, isn't it? Sindel turns around you, you, and she sees a massive explosion and then she runs a bit further and then she looks at her wrist and it all, fla- like the the indicator flashes red and then she makes the decision that they're dead there. But to me, that's like, oh, we can't really show it. Yeah. We want them to die. So here's a MacGuffin to explain that they are dead. Yeah. Um, well, it was th- those life those life monitors or whatever they are were in the first film. Yeah, yeah, they're in, yeah. They're in Cal- that's how they knew the parents were still alive and that yeah, they should that- go and find them because the heartbeat sensors were still going. But yeah, fantastic they range on those devices. I know, uh, but the, but what for, for, like they never really explained how they worked, and I kind of wish no. it was a bit more kind of yeah. is it is it on you know is it on heartbeats? What is it? And and then even even looking at them when they're like bleep bleep bleep. It's it's not like bleeping the 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 light the green lights going the red lights going the blue lights going. I'm like, what yeah. what do all those indicate? What does that tell me? Yeah, which was was fuck all basically. Um, <laughs> and and what and for example, what what happens if if you know it gets removed or it gets damaged? Do you just assume people are dead? Yeah. Like, how, how does yeah, that exactly. how does that work? Um, yeah. Yes. So <laughs> so <laughs> we've opened with a massacre um, in this kids film. Oh, for kids. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, that's, it's fine. You get, you, you need, you can have tension and death and misery in kids' films, but it just, it just doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit. It doesn't feel right for the film. It's almost like they went, we need something drastic to separate this. So just kill everyone. And then but for the for the rest makes of the film, even weirder. Yeah, for the rest of the film, all you hear is Sandel talking about fucking death. Like she's like, my family are dead. Your part, your your pilot is dead. Everyone is dead. Why am why will I be dead soon? I'm having a nightmare. I'm gonna be yeah, dead. Why should we bother? We'll all be dead. You know. What? And again, again, her acting has improved very slightly, but I know, I know. Yeah, I, it is. Not by much, but you know, fair fair credit to her. I know when they hired her, she couldn't memorize the lines, and they would have to feed her lines, and you can yeah. tell a lot yeah. of the t- a lot of the time where it's like, I really like the Ewoks. Beat, 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 smile. You know, it, it's like it's like she forgets that she's supposed to be happy in that moment or what she's feeling, yeah. um, and it's just it, you can you can see it and you can feel it and you're like, oh, if only. Um, but yeah, she's she's clearly not an actress. Didn't act after this either um, after these films, which yeah. not surprising. Um, but it's you know it's for certain kids it's just not their bag or it's not their it's not in their skill set. You know, that, yeah. and that's fair. Um, but she does what she can, but it's still not. Great. The uh, wicket carries, carry, you know, protects her. And don't they, they end up in a cave, don't they? Yeah, so they're being, they're being chased by orcs and basically they're just, they're chased into a, a mountainside, aren't they? Mm. And um, they manage to get into a cave and the orcs fall to a grisly death, mm. more death. Um, <laughs> and then she's, they come across a big dragon thing, don't they? And the dragon carries her off and Wicket's dead sad and manages to find a flying machine. <laughs> like that 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 annoyed me because because she Sindel goes, Oh no, now we're trapped. Because like yeah. he's 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 kind of destroyed all the rock formation. Yeah, there's no way out. Yeah. And then, oh, there's a convenient hole in the wall and and a glider. That seems yeah. to be a quite very that's a very, very, very convenient thing. Yeah, it's like, oh, somebody else was gonna do this before, but you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna bother kind of looking too much into that. No, off we go. Hey. Yeah. yeah. I did. I did quite laugh when she got picked up by the dragon. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, again, it was stop motion, wasn't it? So it's a very Harryhausen effect. You know, mm. you can see like her like writhing. You know, like you used to see in the old the you know, Greek, <laughs> the Greek, yeah. the old Greek Jason, uh, Jason the Argonauts. Yeah, all that yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. With her like writhing, or 
<laughs> when people are getting eaten by dinosaurs in those old films, they're like, oh god, you see them writhing and wriggling. Oh. It does. It looks pretty funny. It doesn't. It doesn't have the effect of tension at all because immediately, like Wicket is able to distract it so that it drops her and then yeah. she catches it. Oh, it's just. And then they land on the conveniently in an open plane, but conveniently enough that there's plenty of cover so the dragon can't get them. And then the dragon just fucks off. And it's yeah, like, it. I can't be bothered. That's it. I, I, I mean, I could have done with more information about the dragon. I thought that was a cool design, a cool a cool creature. Like, that's what I like. I like the creature designs and stuff, minus the spider. Yeah, it, yeah the, the creatures that aren't... That we don't know we, as... We see every day in our, yeah. you know, in our lives. Yeah. Or, or on end or outside of these films, you know. It's, it's, yeah. it's something yeah. a bit different, something a bit new. I, I like that, and I like the work that goes into practical effects and stop motion and things like that. So yeah. I, I, I always, I'll always dig that. Then they kind of, <laughs> again, a bit depressing. Yeah. They, they, is... they start getting cold and start starving to death, basically. Yeah. Um, it's pretty horrible, actually. It's kind of like, oh god, what's the end game here? <laughs> to, to, to die. This is this is their Empire Strikes Back. You've had your new hope of Ewok movies, and this is your Empire yeah. Strikes Back. Um, and they come across another human on Endor. No, they, that's it. They come across this. I think it's Teak or Teakle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, which is like this fast-moving gremlin or goblin or something. Um, yeah, friendly. That's what he is. Yeah, friendly, but he's like he's like Quicksilver but furry um, kind of thing. <laughs> you move at speed, um, and then he he leads them to Wilford Brimley's character, um, star of one of our favorite films, The Thing. And I have to say, I'm quite glad he turns up because I was like, oh my god, good acting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But even even then, he's he's completely exposed by terrible writing, terrible yeah. writing. Because some of some of his scenes are so flat and it feels laboured. It feels like he's talking to a wall because there's there's no there's nothing to react to him. Yeah. It's just him trying to power through and show emotion. Because initially he doesn't want to help them. No. He, he throws them out when he sees them in in their house. When the, um, Teak brings them to the house, he's like, "What are they doing here? I told you, no strangers. Get out." Yeah, and then he kind of has that moment of like, fine, you can stay one night. You know, the, that trope that we we always see when mm. somebody rescues someone or something, and then they end up staying a little bit longer. But Sindel starts to have these kind of feelings or these these visions, and she knows that she needs to go and you know find this power thing. Mm. It's it's all very weird. And what I find about this plot in particular, more so than Caravan of Courage, is it it's convoluted as sin. It rarely sort of fits together. Even in its basic elements, it's kind of like, oh, we need to go here now. So just, just cut to it. Just get there. Just go there. It's it, At the same time, it feels convoluted and flimsy. Like it's very thin. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so thin. The it's decisions so- they make that end up getting them to the castle to to fight the, the, you know, the, the main bad guy. I can't even remember the reason. I don't even know how they get there or why they get there. I know, I know. The, Sindel gets trapped by, by the um, the witch, doesn't she? Yes. Like, the witch, yeah. witch masks herself, mm. and you know, looks like a dead, uh, beautiful woman who says, "Oh, your family's still alive. I can help you. I can help you." And then she tricks her, takes her away, and whatever. But then she escapes, and it all goes wrong, and they're all very yeah. confused, and it's just a confusing. confusing yeah, I, I believe I believe she's kidnapped because somehow the witch is like. Because they have this power, this power yeah. generator or power source, whatever it is, and they're like, "Oh, we can't use it." And and the witch, yeah. like, the witch, kind of told the guy again, Tarak, I'm going to call him, and he he's like, "This is the power. This is the power." We later find out that the Wilford Brimley's character, uh, Noah, he's called, isn't it? His character, Noah. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, his co-pilot in his ship went off to kind of find another power source for the ship to take off, and is is captured by. Terak years ago and is told about this power and obviously and then you see this really shit pile of bones. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like a like a university pile of bones. Yeah, just like yeah, we just like we just get that from a, a you know a doctor, a medical examiner, we just stick it there. Um and it's like he told us. But then the witch seems to know more about it. But then and he's like, yes, we need the power, let's get the power, let's get the power. But then she didn't know how to fucking use it either. So I'm just like yeah. Why is she so keen on this if she doesn't know how to? And she's like, "Yeah, well, it's, well it's the, so the child must. The child must know how to use it. Clearly, yeah. it's it's so clear that they entered a dead end and didn't know how to get themselves out of it. 
Yeah. Like we've got the power, we've got the power source, we've completed our mission. Oh fuck! But when we've got gaping gaps of where the plot goes, uh, we need to round this up. How do we round it up? Um, nobody knows how to use this power. Nobody really knows what they want the power for either. Why does he want the power? Why does he want the power source? Why does he want essentially a battery? I don't think he. What knows. does he want it for? That's what, that's what I to... think. Yeah. I don't think even he knows, and he just comes across as fucking like. I don't mind like a stupid villain or a you know a one that's a bit more simple, like a basic villain, and, yeah. and they just want very simple things. They're not this Machiavellian type. I don't mind that, but he just seems like he's just like, I want that thing because I want it. Yeah, I want yeah, it now. No, yeah, and that's what it boils down to. There's literally no, there's no explanation of what they want to use the power for. I don't think I can't remember. I yeah, might I zoned out completely, but. Because the witch has this power herself. that She's able to manipulate environments herself and other things around her. What, what, what is the end game for the power source? What is it going to do? Is it going to, is it going to reign? I would have bought it if he said, I'm going to use this power to reignite, you know, yeah, a something. secret chamber within this castle that we have so that I can rule over this planet and forge my own empire. I would have been like, okay, cool. Yeah. That's your end or he, game. Or he had, if he had like a massive turret that needed to be charged by this power and it would help him, yeah. you know, yeah, but there's, kill, there's kill no Gorax reason. or something. Like, yeah, yeah, like the idea of maybe having a massive gun or a, a special weapon that would kill a Gorax would make sense to me. Um, Cause that's, that's kind of a legitimate threat within Endor and within those films, you know, but again, it's just nothing. It's just like it's yeah. just a nothing thing. It's it, just it, like it's literally it's just a literally just a plot device that goes nowhere. I tell you what would have been better is if the dad gave Sindel the power source, and they and throughout the film they're chasing them. Yeah, that would make more sense. The fact that they just the the fact that the villains get what they want straight away is is boring to me. Like it's it's not. Yeah, yeah. you know. Again, the heroes don't get what they want, and the the villains get what they want straight away. It's not. It's not like, you know, like um, Loki wanting to be locked up or, you know, Wrath of Khan, you know, wanting to be locked up and then they escape and it's yeah, all yeah, part yeah. of the plan. It's not like that. It's just, we got it. What do we do with it? Don't know. How does it work? Don't know. Should we ask that little girl? Sure. Yeah, sure. Oh, she doesn't know either. Now what do we do? Um, oh, wait, she's escaping. Uh, Chase bye. her. Oh, wait, the Ewoks are all banding together. And then the film. And that's exactly what happens. Literally, that is exactly what happens. Tarak loses his shit because the girl goes, I don't know how it works. Mm. So he locks her up and the witch, Cheryl, yeah. locks them both up. And then the Ewoks and Noah, like Wicket and a couple of other Ewoks who they find still like, you know, safe or whatever, come, come and rescue them all. And then there's a big chase, sort of like a Mad Max Fury Road kind of chase back to where it all started in the Ewok village. And the don't, don't compare it to and, don't compare it to Mad Max. That's too no, no. to compare it to. <laughs> oh god, yeah. But you know, just in that basic sense, literally chasing them across like where the entire journey they've had before. Yeah. Back to the Ewok village and the Ewoks get the upper hand and manage to turn turn over the entire battle in their for, in their favour. Hmm. But it, the film's called Battle for Endor. There's no there's no there's no level of threat in the film to suggest that the stake of Endor, you know, well, the Endor is at stake itself, yeah. which I would have bought, like you said, if he was using this power source to make a weapon or to reignite the, the castle, which has some kind of power in it or something else in it. Yeah. More, more pointedly, I probably would have, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, these films using magic and everything and say it's the force, this power source, you could have, used it sort of like a proto thing that we get in rogue one where it's a kyber crystal and kyber crystals were used used to explain how the death star is able to amass that much power but it might might well have been it might well have been a proto a prototype kyber crystal kind of design where this power source is a huge power source even in its smallest fragment it's able to create weapons it's able to create you know connections to other objects or people something a bit more akin to that if it had been like this is a kyber crystal i can use this to make a weapon you would have been like oh okay he wants a lightsaber yeah he wants because he's got a sword he's got a massive fuck off sword mm. what's the next stage up from using that sword he's heard about you know these legends of people using light swords i want one of them that's a good motivation for a villain i want that i want this i want this power again that's that's like indiana jones what's what's in the ark of the covenant it's power so what do the Nazis want? They want that power. 
and they don't look at the dangers associated with the power because they just want the power. And you could have had that same thing. He maybe gets a lightsaber, and that's how he's defeated mm. because Wicket gets the lightsaber and uses that against him, or he kills himself. You know, anything would have been better than what was in this, which is nothing. There is nothing in this. There's nothing in this. The power source amounts to nothing. It's just a throwaway plot device to get get things moving yeah. and not very much moves. <laughs> it does it does very it feels like one of those 80s sword and sorcery movies kind of like you know like Conan the Barbarian you know the there is again they they steer right into the fantasy. Why not make why not make that power source you know I get that they they want to use the old ship of Noah's to get off the planet finally and and go somewhere safe. Um, I get yeah. that, but all this magic, if you're going to steer into the fantasy again, why not, what about some of the, the magical stuff that the Ewoks had in the first film? Why not, yeah. you know, what if he finds out, he goes, oh, the, the Ewoks are really good at magic. Maybe I want one of these magical devices or something that was set up in the previous film. <sighs> like some of the stuff does carry over, but they do seem very separate as well, very separate yeah, entities, yeah. even though they are direct, a direct sequel uh, to yeah. the other film. It still feels like very much its own thing. Tonally, it's different. Um, you know, a lot of the actors aren't there. You know, it, it just feels very, very disconnected, especially that opening and the ending of the previous film. It just doesn't, yeah. doesn't gel. Um, yeah, if you were to watch them back to back, you'd be like, what the fuck happened in between? <laughs> well, I mean, I watched it. I watched them both uh, basically two days apart. And yeah. And again, I did as well. And again, they they felt utterly, completely different. Um, and yeah, it's just... I, I think, again, Wilford Brimley does help because it feels a little bit more like a film. It feels like it's, it's not just like a few kids have turned the camera yeah. on. Yeah, there's, uh, there's, no, there's no narrator in this at all. There's no narration. It literally is more like a film. And like you said, it is. it does tap more into like a medieval kind of setting, which, you know... To me, these these films are less Star Wars and more Dungeons and Dragons, more Lord of the Rings kind of thing. They have that feel of Lord of the Rings more than they do Star Wars. They're only Star Wars because some of the sound effects, some of the laser blasts sound like TIE fighters and the Ewoks. Mm. For me, there's not there's not much else of connected tissue towards Star Wars. Like like I said, there's, there's a reference to the force, like the magic. Um, the weapon, even the weapons, don't really look Star no. Warsy. They don't. They don't. They don't resemble. You know, if they had, if they had Imperial blasters or Rebel blasters, you know, for a for a Star Wars fan, you would have gone, oh, they've got Rebel blasters. Mm. Okay, you know, oh, I recognise that weapon. I recognise that look. A apart from the Ewok, you take the Ewoks out and put any other kind of creature in there, it's not a Star Wars film. Yeah, it it just isn't. Yeah, I I agree. Um, I I have a theory. I think this. Ooh, I, like, I like theories. Just like don't try and cover up the cracks. Oh no, no, no! <laughs> it's not. It's not. Um, it's not a, a a fan theory or anything like that. Oh, okay. An, an actual theory. It's an actual theory. So, um, even the costuming and the characters and the 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 orcs do look very fantasy inspired. Now, I'm thinking that the either the idea or the nugget of the idea for the film Willow had begun. Uh, to kind of germinate, or that they were creating things for the film Willow, which is a fantasy film yeah. by Lucasfilm. You know, it's definitely it's got Warwick Davis in it. You know, there's yeah. there's you know there's 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 links. You know, and it feels more fantasy. So I think maybe you know they did use like a lot of these films did use costumes and set and you know special effects and you know matte paintings. You you name it from the previous films from Return of the Jedi. Um, so why not? You know, why not, would it be like a tester or yeah. try, trying to say, how do we do a good fantasy film? Or how do we, you know, corner, we've cornered the action market with Indiana Jones, the period action piece. We've, we've cornered the sci-fi market. How do we do fantasy and what do we do? And and can we learn from this? And I reckon most, I'm prob I don't know, I've not looked this up, but I reckon a lot of the team on this film probably went off and did Willow as well. Like they were still probably yeah. hired to do that. So I reckon there's there's some kind of connective tissue there, whatever that may be. Um, yeah. I, I think there's some there's definitely some kind of idea swirling in Lucas's brain or some of the other guy's brain. You know, we've got Warwick Davis. Um, you know what, I'll tell you what the film reminds me of a little bit. Um, it reminds me of Time Bandits. You ever seen Time Bandits? Oh, 
God, yeah. I yeah. I can't stand it. I, I've tr- I try. I, I've watched. I've watched it fully. I've watched it fully a couple of times, but I've, I've never enjoyed it. But I know exactly what you, what you, what you, where you're heading. Yeah, because the the reason they the reason they they wanted a child actor, um, and they were like, well, we need you know characters of his stature, or it's going to be difficult to film. So they were like, we'll we'll just hire little people to play the the bandits, which you know makes sense to me. And I think I think maybe that's a lot of the the thoughts behind these films is that we've got Ewoks, you know, we can do it in one shot. If we have a yeah. child and and a little person, you know, it's fine. We can just do that. Um, so I reckon some of the the ideas behind that. Now we have lost the narration in this film, which I'm glad of. Yeah. However, however, we have introduced probably the more troubling canonical, you know, continuity issue of the talking Ewoks because Wicket can now yeah, be mean, full English and looks absolutely creepy doing it. Yeah, I mean, it it, it is completely bizarre. It doesn't fit at all, um, but it's done. It's done purely for the basis of, well, we need to explain a few things. We can't just have Sindel crying all the time. Um, make him talk, <laughs> and to me, that's it. There's, there's no other creative decision around it. I don't think, and it does. It does fuck with the with the like the canon of it. And like I said briefly, like the idea is that. Sindel and her family aren't talking actually English. They're talking a different language. Obviously, us as the viewer hears it as English, but the the fan sort of like covering up the cracks of this is that the fan theory is that oh, when when Wicket meets Leia, he doesn't quite understand her because she's speaking pro- she's speaking proper English, yeah, yeah, like galactic English, whereas Sindel's family is speaking a variant language altogether. So they're humans, but they're not speaking galactic English. Bullshit. Um, I think it's just it's just um, it's just oh shit. Um, we, we're finding it really difficult to explain what's going on. Um, quick, go for it. Say something, Warwick, if you want. Which is fine because this is it's it's where Warwick finds his voice, mm. and I think without this, you don't get Willow, mm. like you were saying. So it's good in the sense that this is where Warwick gets his full acting opportunity. It is creepy. It looks creepy because they add like in like a loose jaw to when he's talking, which it's just flopping around. It's like he's broke his jaw and he's going, oh, 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 help me, please. Yeah, it, it looks but, like it looks like he's got it on a string, and every time yeah. he, he speaks, he yeah, somebody's underneath going, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, <laughs> but like 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 I said, it's it, it's great for Warwick Davis because it's his voice. You hear his voice and. It actually frees up his character a little bit. You can see you see him jesting, and when he's saying uh, he's trying to like when Noah comes over and he's like, "What are you doing here? Who are you?" You know, he's like trying to trying to shield her and try and comfort her. You know, trying to look after her. So you get these extra gestures, these extra emotions. So it does free up Warwick Davis, but it just fundamentally, <laughs> it's just it it's awful. It doesn't fit. <laughs> it doesn't work, and I don't like it purely because. I've read several fan things saying, "Oh well, it, it is it is canon now. The Leia could talk to him. Well, it, she doesn't. <laughs> she doesn't. They don't know what they're saying. That's why they use three PO to tell them not to eat them. <laughs> Leia goes three PO. Tell them <laughs> they are our friends. <laughs> so he, he's the protocol. <laughs> <laughs> Just fuck off. Um, he is the protocol droid. That's the whole thing, and he's you know." <laughs> Again, it's it's stuff that is set up in Return of the Jedi where they're like, nah, it doesn't work for this film, so, yeah. you know. Um, but again, like you said, it, it just throws the... Where, where does it sit? Where, where do these films sit? Who knows? Who knows? Um, do you want to know what the tagline for this movie was? Speaking of the battles and the... Because it is a bit more action-packed, this one, I, I will say. Yeah. Um, it, there's a, there are a bit more kind of those fantasy battles or what you would expect yeah. from a kind of sword and sorcery fantasy movie. The tagline was... The mightiest combat of the galaxies. 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 Yes, plural. All multiple so, galaxies. All the, this was the greatest of those battles. The mightiest of the combat in all of the galaxies ever, for all time. This not not Return of the Jedi. Not that whole. Not the battle of Endor. The battle for Endor. That was the one. That was yeah. the one. <laughs> Freaking hell. I mean, literally, in my my brain has just flashed through literally all the major moments of the Battle of Endor, 
with um, the Falcon flying through all the ships, all the Star Destroyers, like Brit- Lando saying, bring all the Star Destroyers, bring- go into the Star Destroyers, and they'll tear us apart, we'll-, we'll last longer than we will, if there's a fucking Death Star. Epic moments. Mm. No, go fuck yourself. Battle of the Galaxies. Oh, who wrote that? Who wrote that? Come on. Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's, it's making me even more angrier. I actually think I actually think like, spoiler alert, I think this film is somewhat better right. than Caravan of Courage, but oh, I'm just angry. I'm just angry. I'm like Anakin now. I, I don't even have the high ground. I'm just <laughs> I just want to cut my own legs off. <laughs> Drop me off in Mustafar because yeah, take me much. to Mustafar and throw me into that fucking lava pit with that <laughs> dickhead over there. <laughs> oh, we're breaking so many people's hearts. Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry. I am sorry. If you do like these films, I am sorry. But at the same time, oh no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm with you on this. I'm with you on this. And I, uh, you know, and I've I've put us both through this. Um, you know, obviously you were going to do it. You know, you were already thinking about doing it. But I've put <laughs> instead put us both through these. Films. Yeah. The problem is, I don't know how I'm going to do it myself though, for for my own little my own little channel review. I don't know how I'm going to do it and keep contained or. Anything, I might just go full on out and get ridiculous. I don't know. I think, I think well, you should. I think you should just make it like thirty seconds and just go. It's a piece of shit. Yeah, I end mean, of, I might do. I end, might of, do. end of end of line. <laughs> I might do. That's a good idea, actually. Uh, <laughs> but one thing I will say, like speaking of positives, there is a positive. There is a, a big positive in this film for me, and it is it is the the witch, uh, Corral, and I think. This witch, you know, she has this magical sort of ring, this uh, power charm, or whatever. And from what I'm reading, um, it, it, she's a precursor character for a set of um, figures called the Night Sisters. And the Night Sisters appear first in the Clone Wars TV series. And they're set on um, the same planet that Darth Maul comes from, uh, Dathomir. So the same kind of civilization, same sort of people, and they use magic similar to the Force, but they use it to, you know, control elements and control life as well. So again, you're tapping into that whole sort of like, you know, you can use the Force to create life and whatever. And they are very much magic. It's very much magic. Not much of it's explained, but they are very powerful beings. And like I said, you've got Darth Maul, who is a son of Dathomir, and another character who features very, very prominently, who's one of my most recently established adored characters, Asajj Ventress, who is trained by Count Dooku. She is one of the Night Sisters. She is one of the daughters of the Night Sisters. So Karal is sort of like that prototype figure for the Night Sisters. So without Karal here, you wouldn't get Asajj Ventress. You probably wouldn't even get Darth Maul because that sort of idea comes from all of that. So that is the, that's the main positive for me. And again, that just shows you sort of like when you could, when Disney or well, not Disney, so, so to speak, but when, when certain elements of these Star Wars legends want to be uplifted, they can be uplifted to a perfect place. Hmm. And like I said, Asajj Ventress, I've got her, her dual lightsabers right behind my head as well. And, you know, she's one of my favorite characters purely because of the way she looks, which again is very similar to the way Corral looks. And there is, I can't remember the lead night sister in the show, her name, but she, yeah, very, much, she very much looks like Corral in this, that grandiose sort of costuming, the, 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 the jewelry, the look, the hair, even the style of acting, you know, the very sort of like very straight, very, very much like you'd say like a stereotypical powerful witch yeah. that doesn't look all haggard or whatever. So she's beautiful, she's beautiful, she's got dark eyes, dark hair, but her eyes are really, really bright as well and, you know, deep. You get that with sort of like the Night Sisters. You know, they are very beautiful creatures, but they're deadly. They will fucking kill you. So that is the the main takeaway from from, from this film for me is that that uplifting of the characters. Yeah, I I, I agree. Like I love um, that's one of the sections of the Clone Wars I absolutely love the whole Night Sisters, Dathomir, Darth Maul, Savage Press. Um, oh, Savage Press, yeah, brilliant. Oh, so good. And voiced by the legend that is Clancy Brown, one of my favourite actors. Yeah, actors. When, I, when I heard the voice, I went, great character. Yeah. Great mate. character. Immediately, I was like, yes, they know exactly what they're doing with Savage. 
Yeah, great, great storyline. Um, you know, I love Asajj, you know, coming away from Count Dooku. Uh, yeah, kind of spoilers, brilliant. Spoilers a little bit. She, yeah, and she's, I've, yeah, I've just got up to uh, a certain point. Again, it probably is spoilers for people who haven't watched it, but I, I won't, I won't ruin it. But her journey is amazing, great, interesting, fascinating. Um, again, there's a lot, there's a lot of good stuff in the Clone Wars, more good stuff than bad stuff. I love the, anything that focuses on the clones is great as well. I really like that. Um, I watched one which I thought was going to be absolute shite as well, which was this frog guy, this frog general, and he commands a mission that's uh, loads of astromech droids, and they have to kind of sneak in and grab like a microchip. Yeah. And and that went on for like five, six episodes. Um, yeah. And I thought it would be utter dog shit. I was like, this is going to be crap. But I ended up bloody loving that, that episode, those yeah. episodes. Um, and, you know, and, and the, if you can get me to care about any show that can get me to care about robots or androids or droids or clones, you know, you've got my money, you've got my attention. If you can make me care about those tertiary, you know, often not focused on characters, because there's so many great clone um, episodes with just the clones, and I think they're fantastic. When they're done well, they're done great. Um, yeah. It's an amazing show. Probably one of the best Star Wars properties I've ever seen. Again, does have, you know, there's a lot of episodes, so there's a few stinkers in there, but oh, yeah. for the I most part. Quite a few. Uh, and I can see, I can see why people wouldn't like it because it is told out of it's non-linear, so all the episodes are out of uh, stories are out yeah, of order. They're out of sync. Yeah. I mean, so, even for me, even for me, there's some of them that was like, I'm not sure where it takes place exactly. Yeah. But can you can find it? I mean. Yeah, I think the, the internet places. Yeah, yeah, I think the internet. Well, I think someone's. I think people on the internet have listed the correct order to watch them in. Yeah. Um, so if you wanted to do, that, it's a bit painstaking to find each episode. Yeah. And go through. I think one of them you have to go all the way to like season four. In when you're watching season one, you need to jump to season four to watch the episode, then jump back, and it's kind of like yeah, I can't, can't really be bothered doing that. Yeah, I can't be asked either. So I'll ju- I'm just watching them as you know, yeah. as as they were, um, well, as, as they were created. Yeah, but like you said, like you're made to care about characters some of the lower characters lesser characters in the clone wars hmm. there's nothing in these two films where i care no and that's the problem that's the problem with it star wars has always been about creating characters that you care about you feel invested and you feel like you're you're on, on the journey with them there's there's no there's no characters here nothing does that there's no there's no sort of element where you go oh i understand i want to be a part of that you know I, I I feel for that journey. Yeah. No, it, it doesn't. It does. It doesn't feel here. It feels like, like you said, a very tired '80s typical fantasy genre film that's swallowed up by better fantasy genre films. Yeah, I, I, the, and the Black Cauldron. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a dark Disney movie. Yeah, it's kind of like that dark kind of children's era. 80s movies, those kind of labyrinths and, you know, all yeah. that sort of stuff. Well, again, yeah, just swallowed up by likes of Labyrinth, which is better. Why? Oh, yeah. Because you, you're interested in the characters. You care about the characters. Even though David Bowie's character in Labyrinth is weird and freaky, yeah. you love it because he's interesting. You get invested in what he's trying to do, even though what he's trying to do doesn't really make sense. But you love it because you're like, the character's there. Hmm. And it's, it's Jim Henson, and they're all about character. Even the puppets yeah. are full of fucking character. Exactly. But exactly. He, here, the humans, you know, Sindel, like you were saying, we don't fucking care. Sindel has gone through the worst fucking, you know, abrupt death of yeah. her, her entire family in her life, and she can't act herself out of a paper bag. She can't fucking sing either, which is awful. <laughs> oh, my God. I've never... I've never gone. Oh, really? Really? Yeah. Sing me yeah. That. again. Wilfred Brimley is putting so much into what he's given. Uh, yeah. I feel, I feel bad for him, and he's. I remember uh, people. People make fun of. There's like a meme that goes around because he's got diabetes. He's always going like, "I've got diabetes. I got the diabetes." You know, there's all those kind of memes about it, and I'm just like, yeah. I'd rather watch that. I'd rather watch a repetition of him pronouncing diabetes. Yeah. Uh, you know, than, than hearing this That's- fucking song. That's that singing reminded me of when the girl sings in Hook. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I mean, like, I get, I get it. I get what they're trying to do, trying to make it poignant, and you know. But oh, I just you don't, don't you don't care. You don't care because she's it doesn't like, work. Yeah, you just I'm don't sad. care. I'm sad. My parents are dead, and and obviously off camera, like the, she can't cry because she's not even acting really. Yeah. Off camera, you know, someone's like licked their thumb and then put it down her cheek to to, yeah. imita- to imitate crying. But again, it's like, I'm sad, beep, 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 frown, 
uh, you know, it's it, again, yeah. you can just tell it's just not it's not there. She's just doing as she's told, and they turn the camera on, and they're just like, you know, yeah. we'll edit, we'll edit round this. And Wilford Brimley, you can tell he's been so supportive and so caring to all these little child yeah. actors or the the little people that are acting. You know, he's doing such such a uh, you know again he is limited by the script and he's limited by the character but i think he really is trying and trying to make this special you know it's not his you know he's not on the level of like when he's in the thing and he's like don't trust clark you know yeah he's he's gone fucking mad and he's putting his fingers in somebody's face you know it's nowhere near that level but i i i i get that he's trying and i can see that he's trying i can see that he's at least attempting like everybody else is like you know, we've got non-talking characters who are now talking. And even then, like you said, like Warwick, again, is doing the best he can, but he's limited by the the props, yeah. the costume, the script, the writing, the everything else that's going on. Um, I always feel bad because, you know, we, we've, we've been actors, we've acted. And I always feel bad for the acting yeah. things because they're always like, you know, and even the ones that seem to be bad, you know, in, especially in Lucas productions, I'm always like, is it the writing? Is it the direction? You yeah. know, is he just saying quicker and more intense all the time? Is that all he's Don't saying? Like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is, is it? Is it? Is it? Because at the end of the day, it's kind of really down to the director to get yeah. those get the performance. Well, yeah, I, I've experienced it firsthand with like just terrible, terrible writing and terrible decisions. Mm. You know, like I, I did bloody Punch and Judy, a live action version of Punch and Judy, <laughs> on stage, and. In hindsight, it was the worst decision you could possibly imagine because the the writing's not there for a stage production of it. So what came across, what was meant to be harmless and you know, you know, sort of like with with an like element a call of like, back. Oh. Yeah. yeah, like yeah. a callback or like uh, with an element of like, oh, be careful what you wish for, be careful, you know, what you do to others, mm. bullying and all this. It didn't come across, it came across creepy, it came across violent. Mm. and very very fucking disturbing mm. and, and a lot of school a lot of a lot of schools that we uh, we took it to a lot of performances we had the reaction was just completely like oh god what is this and that's what you get with this i mean the weight was put my on mine and you know um nathan's shoulder to really sell every aspect of it and you can see that with wilfred brimley you can see you can see you can see the weight of knowing he's in a star wars film mm and trying to make it work and you can see that and you can hear it in the way in his acting he's sort of like giving everything to it you mm. know you know whether it be 78 percent, whatever you can pretty, see that you, still, you can see that he's still giving it yeah and it's the, the, there's no payoff there's no payoff to it because there's no payoff in the script there's no payoff in the writing similar to punch and judy there was no payoff in the writing or the script or the direction to make there it work go. And again, like I've, I've been in similar acting situations. You kind of just, you know, you come up with an interesting idea for a character, or you've got an idea, or you want because you, you want it to be a collaborative process. That's the, yeah, the end of the idea. You want yeah. you want to you want to feel. I remember I did a I did a play about the first women's football team ever, um, and I was asked to play great story. Um, yeah, and it, absolutely it, it, great story. Inspiring, and it was set during World War One. You know, it, again, it was very much like fringe kind of theatre. It wasn't paid. You know, and I and I had to play an abusive husband. One of the characters was an abusive husband, uh, and I said, "Right, I've got this really good idea." He's shell shocked. He's not really sure what he's doing. You know, he's he's lashing out, but he instantly regrets it. He doesn't know how to manage his feelings. And they said, "Nah, don't want that." They said, "Just be a stereotypical wife beater." And I and I, and I was like, "So I, either I can go against that, what the director has said, or." I can I can give them exactly what they want, and I decided to just give them what they wanted. Uh, yeah. And I remember, you know, our friends Nathan and uh, and Matt, his brother, came, and they were just like, "I'm sorry, but that was an awful play." And I was like, "Yeah, it's not great." And and they were like, and they looked at and they looked at my performance as the as the wife beater, and like, "We're really sorry, Dan, but that was not great." And I was like, "I understand." Yeah, you, you, you want you want people to tell you that as well. You want yeah. people to tell you that it's not been great, but like for me, like. Well, I don't, I don't act anymore. But that's that's the way I look at. That's the way I review films. That's how I, how I review review media from like sort of like that. I'm not. I'm, Christ Almighty, I'm not a successful actor. I never was, but I, I did enough work, you know, to sort of inform some of the decisions that I would try and take into what I was doing. Like you say, if somebody says, "Oh, don't do that," I'd still be like, "Okay, I, I, if you don't want me to, if you don't want me to ex- express it that way." You know, I'd still try and use some of those thought processes to try and enhance yeah. for myself the character. 
Mm. For example, um, I read something about Adam Driver for Kylo Ren, where basically he said, like, he created, he tried to create sort of like a backstory for himself to build upon, to create, to take the character to where it was going, um, because obviously they didn't want to give him too much information, you know, about what was going to happen in Last Jedi and uh, Rise of Skywalker, because let's face it, they were writing it on the fly. Um, so he was creating sort of like a, you know, a backstory for his character and he took it to them and he said, look, this is what I think, this is how we're going to go, you know, I think, you know, this is where the character would go. And they shut it down completely. Hmm. I mean, Adam Driver is a really good fucking actor. He's probably the best actor in those films, apart from Domhnall Gleeson. And Domhnall Gleeson gets completely shat on. Yeah. Um, sorry again, Last Jedi fans, Rise of Skywalker fans. It's just my personal opinion. But yeah, they just, they undermined the actors. You've got, you've got actors of such prowess. You know, in those films, Oscar Such Isaac caliber. as well. Yeah, yeah Oscar caliber. Isaac as well. You know, you've got to give, you've got to give and take. Like you said, it's a collaborative process. If you're creating something from scratch, something brand new, and you want, you, you're hiring actors or whatever, you know, you want to give them something so that they can give you something in return. Absolutely. And from what I was reading about Adam Driver, you know, he, he wanted to put that in. Same thing with John Boyega as well. He wanted to put certain things in all of it was shot down. Yeah. All of it was shot down. And that's in public record now as well. That's not just me making it up. That's in public record. Like John Boyega offered certain things. Oscar Isaac offered certain things. Adam Driver, you know, they were all shot down, all shot down. Yeah. And it's the it's same thing scary. probably with here. You know, it's not, that's not the same thing in these films. Because obviously I don't think there was probably much sort of like creative collaboration. Yeah. But, you know, they could have done a bit more with Wilfred Brimley, I think they could have given him some help. Yeah. I think more than anything. I, I reckon he probably... Even a scene with the witch probably would have enhanced this film just a little bit better because who killed his friend? Who killed his pilot? You know, I wanted to see some kind of reaction between the three of them. You know, Tarek, if that's his name, the witch, and Noah. I wanted to mm. see that sort of resolution. A resolution something. there. Yeah. An I, acceptance I... of my friend is dead rather than Sindel telling me, Oh, he's dead, by the way. I saw his bones. I was just, I was <laughs> okay. just, I was just about to mention that he makes this whole thing about, oh, you know what? I realised that my friend probably is never coming back. Probably is dead. Um, you know, yeah. I've been here for so long. You know, he's and stuck, that, he's, he's stuck on the fucking planet himself. He's stuck on Endor. Yeah, and it's a tragedy, and, and it's, it's something to connect those two characters: Sindel's tragedy and yeah. and Noah's tragedy. And then she's just like, oh, by the way, your mate's dead. Yeah, and he saw like, his bones. Yeah, sorry, his bones, <laughs> by the way. Um, yeah, they told him about the power and all that sort of stuff. And then he just like, right, whatever, we've got to escape this castle. Puts yeah, a bomb on the a, wall, and they're out. Yeah, there's no emotional re no, no emotional resolution to it. And that's annoying. I mean, the, the, the he, he see, he's talking to the witch through the cell. Mm. You know, she's, she's still in the cell, and she's not been released. And she's like, help, let, let me out, and I, I, I can help you. I can help you because Tarek lost his mind. You know, there could have been some moment there of sort of reconciliation, like, I made a mistake. Your friend didn't deserve to die. Tarek's just completely insane. I've been corrupted because of my power. But, yeah, it just all, yeah. it all, it all just moves on too quickly. And at the end, Tarek steals her power and he dies because of it. And there's, not, there's nothing else to it. There's literally nothing else to it. Arguably, the most powerful item in the film is is Karal's ring. And then it kind of gets smashed. And then, again, it's not really explained, but I guess you don't really need it to be explained too much. But you get, it gets smashed in a battle with Brimley and Terak, and then he just kind of turns to stone. Um, that's kind of how it ends. I do I do think this, this film as well has the audacity, I will say audacity, to steal from, from themselves um, the, the scene from New Hope with the turrets, you know, and the TIE fighters come in and it's like, you know, yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. Don't, get, don't get cocky, kid, because they, they take the power source, activate the old ship, and they jump into the turrets to shoot the yeah. orcs. And I was like, are you fucking kidding? Come on. Like, yeah. just... the Ewoks, yet yeah, again, are superbly skilled in... <laughs> operating. <laughs> yeah, exactly, operating starship, star yeah. weaponry. But but like in Return of the Jedi, it was it was good because you know it it sort of like paralleled American Indians and their evolution from you know yeah. 
Native Americans rather of you know evolve, evolving um getting together you know muskets and whatever and using them in their own tactics so yeah okay you can kind of see it but it just it, it all feels just like it needs to happen so we're going to make it happen and that is it and uh, it's it's rubbish it's rubbish <laughs> it's literally rubbish the last little fight between Tarek and Noah is yeah, again, like I said, that's that's resolution, but it doesn't yeah. resolve anything. There's no sort of like moment where they go, I killed your friend and I'm going no. to kill you. There's not even that, not no. even that. And Tarek can talk, we, we hear him talk, and yet he doesn't say anything to Noah. Mm. You're telling me 25 years that Noah's been stuck on that planet, he hasn't come across Tarek? Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> The, during that fight as well, again, like, you know, with, with Sindel's acting, I've, I've, you know, I was talking about beat, 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 smile and stuff like that. For that fight, it, it's the same because you, you hit... Oh, both, yeah, the choreography both. is terrible. Yeah, and you've done fight choreography. You trained in fight choreography, so you know what that should be. Yeah, in the basic um, sense, it's like, you know, advertising your strokes, advertising where you're going, you know, even just like a bit of speed. Mm. It's literally just like, I'm going this way. Ang, now under here. Ang, you're like, oh my God, just kill each other. <laughs> oh God. I'm, I'm, I'm a very big fan of like, in fight scenes, you're supposed, to be a, you're supposed to be trying to kill your opponent. So if you're not aiming for a point where you'll either maim them severely or kill them directly, then I don't buy your action sequence. Mm. So sword fights, if they're just swinging to make a noise, I don't buy it. Like, don't care. My, my, my main point is to go back to the Phantom Menace, that fight scene, every stroke that you see Darth Maul trying to hit, he's aiming for either their head, their legs, or their arms. So he's trying to disable them. Whereas in Revenge of the Sith, they're just spinning the lightsaber at the end. Yeah, pointless. Just spinning them. Just spinning them and doing twirls and whatever. Darth Maul does the twirls, but the ferocity in when he goes in to strike, mm. when it's just him and Obi-Wan in the last little bit, the ferocity of the strike, you look where he's positioning the blades, they're all going towards Obi-Wan's head or to his legs. In this, in, in this, very similar to Revenge of the Sith, they're just swinging them to make it look good. They do a couple of twirls, they get thrown over, and then, ooh, there's no follow-up strike. So somebody gets thrown over, there's no follow-up strike. It's, uh, it's rubbish. Rubbish. It is rubbish. <laughs> it's another rubbish film. Now, I've got two last points, and then we have to compare them because yes. we've got like 20 minutes, about 20 minutes left. Um, I'm, not having a, I'm not having a third part, so no. we're going we're gonna to get started very soon. So, <laughs> so there is, speaking of fan theories, there is a fan theory that Sindel, uh, who leaves the planet of Endor at the end of this film, spoilers, if you are ever going to watch these, um, she leaves, and there's a fan theory that she grows up to be Captain Phasma, apparently. What? Um, yeah, so uh, a fan theory. It's not confirmed, but it's uh, there's a theory because she has blonde hair that she, <laughs> you know, short blonde hair, she becomes Captain Phasma. Um, however, there was a a Legends novel, a Star Wars Legends novel called Tyrant's Test. Now, a grown up, an adult. Uh, Sindel. Now, every time I, th I say Sindel, I just think of the Mortal Kombat character from Annihilation. Oh, God. Too bad you will die. <laughs> yeah. I just always picture her every time I say Sindel. Um, now, she's, oh, she's, a, she's, an, she's an adult. She's a reporter. She's on Coruscant. Um, interviews a guy, a former stormtrooper who survived the Battle of Endor called Hume Tal. Now, in an interview, he says that the uh, the New Republic have played down the atrocities and war crimes committed <laughs> committed on the stormtroopers and the Empire uh, by the Ewoks, um, and is like this. I was there, man. I saw you didn't see what I saw. I was there. You weren't there, man. I saw the butchery, the cannibalism. You. What about those war crimes, eh? What about those? When when is somebody going to answer for them? When are the Ewoks going to answer for those war crimes? Um, I mean, he's not wrong, is he? <laughs> no, he's not. I kind of. I, the, the Ewoks do kind of probably eat the stormtroopers. Yeah. You see, you see them at the in the celebration, like make it. They've made drums out of the stormtroopers' helmets. Like okay. <laughs> To be fair, there is there is some. I think it might still be in the legends um, 
canon and the Star Wars Legends that debris from the second uh, Death Star comes down and and kind of hits a lot of kills a lot off a lot of the uh, Ewoks apparently. Yeah, I, I remember reading that as well. Yeah, but that yeah. that was in Legends. Yeah, that parts of the Death Star crash landed into um, Ewok village in, into into Endor and caused untold climatic damage that set them back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. quite funny. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, also one last point. Um, are these Ewoks like from the ghetto? Because they're not up in the trees. Yeah, you, get, you do bri- in Caravan of Courage. You do briefly see like an upshot of them being in the trees, and then mm. in Battle for Endor, they're on the ground in a nice, lovely village. Yeah, they're like okay, can we not? Couldn't afford the budget to make tree houses, I guess. No. Oh well. <laughs> right. Let's start our comparison. <laughs> let's please end this torture. Oh well. This is this is an this is a Star Wars war crime in itself. Both of these films are a war crime, yeah, a, I mean, a Star Wars crime, if you will. Yeah, very good. So, so as as usual, we have five categories for comparison. <laughs> the first one is writing. Uh, so, which out of these two films do you think <laughs> has, has the best writing? You know what. <sighs> I would probably say uh, maybe Battle for Endor purely because of Noah. I'm clutching at straws, got to be yeah. honest. Um, it's hard. They're both very, very bad. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, just in the basic sense of like having uh, Mr. Brimley. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, Battle for Endor. God almighty. Yeah. So, see, this is hard. This is actually quite a hard choice to make between both of them that's why it's kind of in a way it's a good comparison podcast for that yeah i mean because like usually i have like several thoughts swimming around when we've Mm. done this before i've had like several thoughts about like pros and cons i don't have any for the writing i don't have any pros other than the very simplest basic things of yeah you got the actor the actor's done his best Mm. okay I'm actually going to give this to Caravan of Courage um, because I just think the plot is stronger, the storyline is stronger, um, the through line is stronger. It's not as random or weird or as flimsy a plot. Like you know, yeah. you know the goal, you know where they're going, you know what they need to do. You know, we, there's all these kind of kind of side journeys and side missions. Yeah. But I think I'm going to give it to Caravan of Courage. Uh, yeah. So that's one Fair each. Enough. One each. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> The next, the next category is acting. Um, which oh. film has the best acting in it? Uh, Battle for Endor again, purely because of Mr. Brimley. Mr. Brimley, Mr. Brimley. I am going yeah. to, I'm going to agree. I think Sindel is, has improved slightly in her acting. Um, yeah. Again, we get a bit more Warwick, like you said, with his physicality yeah. and speaking. And also, you've got Wilford Brimley doing the heavy lifting. You know, yeah. obviously, there's other characters like Karan and stuff, but again, like you said, it's Wilford Brimley. Yes. Yeah. So that's- I mean, I can't, I can't think of any notable moments in Caravan that has decent acting because, like you said, it's it's all over encumbered by Mace's weird character choices and yeah. his weird sort of like reaction to everything. Which again, I think is just poor direction. Really, I think it's just it's just yeah. angry. It's just constantly angry. That is, that's his one yeah. thing. It's it's never like oh I'm sad now. It's like I'm slightly less angry now. These are my levels of anger. So I'm a ten now. Oh now I'm a two because the Ewok just saved me from drowning with a magic stick. You know. Yeah. Oh god, that scene is awful. Yeah, that is a bad scene. I, magic I stick. Oh god, Mister MacGuffin number four. Yeah. <laughs> No. We need to create. We need to create some kind of moment of tension. Give them a magic stick so we can drown Mace, and then yeah. they can save him. God, I wish. Why? They oh, because it just happens. I wish they drowned him then instead of in the second film. Got rid of him. In a way, it's kind of a good thing they probably got rid of him. But then again, I'm not sure. Okay. No, I can't be, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, moving on. Whew, this has been a long one. This has been exhausting. This has been an exhausting yeah. watch, and it's been good. It's been good, but it has been. It has been good. Yeah, I mean, it's been fun. Like it's, been, it's been good. Um, and uh, it's, it's nice to look back on these these lesser known films and kind of <laughs> see the mistakes that were made. <laughs> so next one, luckily, is um, probably the best element of, of both of these films. It's the music. Um, so which film do you think had the better music, better score? What do you think? Um, I think Caravan had the better score because 
it feels a bit more because they're going on a journey. The journey is quite grand. It's quite there's quite a spectacle to the journey. Mm. You do get a lot of elements, a lot of you know, like John Williams esque elements in Caravan. In and I can I can I can, I can remember certain keys and moments in Caravan. Battle for Endor, the, the score doesn't quite fit, doesn't doesn't sit, it doesn't quite match what's going on. I think that's because the film just doesn't know what it's doing either. Yeah. So yeah. hey, I think Caravan. Yeah. For me, I, yeah. I I agree. I think Caravan as well, because um, even though it has its own unit, like I think Battle for Endor could as good as the music is, that doesn't feel like Star Wars to me. It no. does, it just feels like a generic fantasy, whimsical score. Um, which is fine, which is there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and it is good in its own right. But you do get a sprinkling of John Williams in, in Caravan, which you don't get in Battle for Endor. And that made me, even, even the little kind of Endor themes and notes and stuff, mm. uh, that's enough for me to go, oh, yeah, it feels like Star Wars. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Star Wars. You do, you do get some of those. You do get quite a lot of wide shots in Caravan of like, you know, when it's night, nighttime and they're looking at the stars and there's like that. You know, um, Endor's um, mother planet, if you like, mm. or you know, just there, and you get those little, you get those little inflections of that, that Star Wars kind of, you know, the sound, grand, the grand yeah. scale of everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, get, you get, you get those tones in the music in Caravan. Um, well, I, I said it like when early on that the, the music is really, really good. Probably the the most positive aspect of Caravan is the music. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, that's music. So moving on to the next one, it's probably I think this is probably one of the tougher categories. It's cinematography. So which had the better look, basically? Of- yeah, so I think this is a hard one. Again, I'd probably go with Caravan purely because, like again, like the the the, the wider sort of like the use of the you know the the matte paintings in the backdrop. Combined with, you know, the foreground of you know a very real forest on the Skywalker Ranch and things like that, um, even uh, even the fucking desert, which is a load of shit. <laughs> you know, it looks pretty good. It looks it looks pretty good. I think the, the modelings of the, of the castle and the way they take the shots and look up at the the castle where the the Gorax is, you know, is very 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 grandiose. Um, if it, it fits better than what we see in sort of the editing and cinematography for Battle for Endor, which is all very flashed and rushed together because it's all more fighting and whatever. Yeah. And so it doesn't quite work because it's all very, there's a lot of jump cuts and edits in Battle for Endor. Or or some horrible smash cuts. Oh, oh, some terrible ones. Absolutely terrible, terrible. And yeah, I think the cinematography, because it's allowed to flow a bit better in Caravan. There are a lot lot of establishing shots, a lot of, you know, wide angle moments where they're where they're just where we're just watching the Ewoks, especially at yeah. the start when the Ewoks are fiddling around with that you know that flying contraption, whatever. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a little bit better there. No, I, I you've taken the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say caravan as well. I I I just agree with everything that you've just said, so I'm not going to repeat, repeat anything that you've just said. Fair but <laughs> I think I think you've you've hit the nail on the head for me as well. It's it's just. It's just better. Yeah, there's a, there was a horror. There's a horrible smash cut. I remember in Battle for Endor where the music's playing in one scene, smash cut into halfway. The music is playing for another one, um, yeah. different music. I was like, oh, that's horrible. That's the one of the worst transitions I've ever seen on film. Um, in one of the worst films yeah. I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Um, yeah, okay, the just shocking. Yeah, it's really shocking. bad. It's really bad. Um, okay, so. Final is direction. Uh, which do you think was the better directed of the two films? Oh. Again, I think this is again another tough one to to compare. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, I don't know. Um, it's, it's tough. I, I'm really, really struggling. Um, I think I think if you're looking for an action movie, like a more kind of straightforward action movie, yeah, then, um, fantasy action movie, yeah, you probably go Battle for Endor. But if you're looking for like a a, a, a to B story, um, one that's more kid friendly, um, and it's a bit more whimsical because the other one's a bit dark. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, I think it just depends on your taste, kind of. But I think I think I'm gonna have to give it to Caravan again because it, yeah, I'm I'm thinking that myself. Just thinking of what you just said there. Yeah. Basic elements of it. It it works. The editing's better. It, it flows a bit better. It's still slow as fuck. Um, yeah. 
like the the other one again start battle friend or just start it's a bit more exciting it's a bit more like da, 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 you know it, it but then the mid the middle falls into that massive pit yeah of um, creative where, rubbish where do we go oh we'll just we'll just sit in this we'll sit on the in the forest for a bit yeah it's the it's the the deathly hallows part one. Oh, what should we do for this film oh we'll just all three of us will just be angry in a forest and jealous of each other that's great yeah i want to what crap that is yeah it's awful yeah um so yeah i think i again talking about the editing and the sloppy editing again it's more action-packed but it's not as again the plot is really flimsy and i think again that suffers um, like online, I think a lot of people prefer this one because it's with Battle for Endor because yeah. it's more action packed. There's a bit more going on. Yeah, but that's, to me, that's to me, that's just that's just surface. That's like, oh, it, it's better because there's action that doesn't necessarily make up for <laughs> faults, the, the faults. even worse inadequacies of the story. Yeah, I agree. I, I think they've they've overcorrected themselves in in Battle for Endor because obviously caravan's a lot slower it's a lot you know it's a lot more paced and it's you know it's a bit more you could it's it's more dull i would say it's dull um yeah. and yeah. i think they've gone well that was dull so now just edit to the action quick quick cut to the action quick 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 quick, quick. yeah um and again that hampers the film and again it's like oh, we don't need to worry about plot just keep make it make it move make it keep it pacey yeah yeah, yeah. keep that brevity keep it going and then people won't complain and uh, <laughs> uh, you know it, and, and it is effective but it also lets the film down as well um yeah definitely so, so i've got to give it to to caravan um yeah, i will as well i will yeah. as well so that, that was reasons so that was uh, for writing. You gave it to Endor. I gave it to Caravan for acting. We both gave it to Endor. Music, Caravan. Cinematography, Caravan. And direction, Caravan. So the winner, the victor of the Clone Wars, if you can call, you can even call it a victor, is Caravan <laughs> of Courage. So if you are going to watch any of these Ewok movies, watch Caravan of Courage, but I would not recommend them, any of them at all. But oh, that, is, that is the best of the worst of the Star Wars movies yeah, I have I think, ever seen. I think, really, if you're going to watch any of these Ewok movies, watch Return of the Jedi. Absolutely, um, yes. To be fair, <laughs> just don't, please, uh, just don't. It may actually sour your opinions on like the Ewoks even further. Ewoks and just, maybe just, Star Wars in general. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the danger of it, isn't it? It's like, what were they thinking? What? I mean, that's the that's the thing for me. I think, like, just looking at it, what were they thinking? <laughs> what, what were they thinking? thinking? What were they thinking? Uh, was it, was I don't it, was think it they pure... were thinking. I don't think they were thinking. No, well, that's just it. Was it pure hubris? You know, they are they are Terak. They haven't got a plan. They haven't got an end game. They are yeah. the Terak. They're like, we'll just do it for the sake of doing it. Money, yeah. I guess. Money. We want money. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, just, yeah. Just create. Just creative hubris. I think. I mean. Yeah, and yeah, for me, I'm 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 seeing that in you know Star Wars at, at the moment. Um, in terms of the films, just creative hubris. I don't I don't think there was any grand plan. For, for these films, other than uh, the holiday special was crap, we need to make something better. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to spearhead it. This is what it's going to be. And like you said, Tony Farina said, you know, yeah. where, where did George Lucas jump the shark? And I think it was, it was these films because it was like, we made money. We need to keep this in the public's eyes. Yeah. More action figures, more toys. It's great. I've got all the toys behind me. Yeah. Great. Keep giving me toys. I'll buy them. I'll buy them. You know, Lego, all that, but at the time, I think it was a case of we need to keep Star Wars in the public eye because, to be fair, they didn't know where they were going mm. with Star Wars after the original trilogy. And I think this, the, these, these films probably actually had a more detrimental effect on slowing down the process of carrying on with the series. Mm. I don't think anybody probably admit it. That's probably me just maybe over speculating, but. Just looking at it, I think people would have gone, we've had the holiday special, which came out, you know, before Empire. It's not great. Mm. And then after Return of the Jedi has been done, we've created this. And then they create the cartoon series, which was garbage as well. And I think probably a lot of people are like, well, let's just let's just sit on it for a while. And a while turned into a few decades. <laughs> so yeah. 
I mean, we, we got the we got all the extended universe stuff. We got the legend stuff, um, and that yeah. of, often that stuff is really good. I love the comics. I love Dark Horse yeah. comics and all that sort of stuff. Novels were were very popular as well, and you know all that other stuff. Yeah, heir, the heir to the Empire novels, bloody great. Yeah, bloody great. They're the ones I read. They're the ones that a lot of people say the sequel trilogy should have followed, really. And I, I after you know, after the culmination of this sequel trilogy we've got, I I think they should have as well. I think they should have. The, the greatest disaster for me is Disney going, it's legends and um, we'll never speak of it again. Mm. And you can see by the fact they've brought Thrawn back and, you know, all these other elements. Yeah, I can see it. I can see it now. They've probably gone, maybe we made a little bit of a mistake. Mm. I don't, they would, they would, they would say they've made a full mistake because there's no way these, these sequels will ever get retconned or whatever. Absolutely. And like you said, let's never speak of them again. Uh, yes. So, so <laughs> that, that is the end of this podcast. It has been long, but it has been great as usual. I don't oh, mind. Absolutely. Do, I don't mind doing I've enjoyed extended. myself to a T. <laughs> so, uh, Andy, where can people find your YouTube channel and your social medias and everything? Because they need to watch some more of your angry review- reviews just like this one. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, um, I don't think I've made anything so angry as this, but. Um, yeah, you can you can find me at um, Angry Andy Reviews on YouTube. Um, I'm on Twitter at uh, Andy underscore Review. Um, also on Instagram as well. I've just started that up. I can't remember what that is off the top of my head. I think it's I think it's Andy. Angry. I'll, I'll, t- I'll tag you, I'll tag you in it because it's like yeah, Andy, yeah, Andy yeah. and then a number, isn't it? Yeah, Andy uh, Angry underscore uh, Andy one one three eight. I think something like that. I don't know. I've just just started up, but yeah. Uh, the main the main go to area is uh, Angry Andy reviews on YouTube. Um, all the other connections are on there as well. Yeah, the yeah. Facebook, the Twitter, um, yeah. the Instagram. Yeah, the Instagram's brand new. So, guys, sign up to the Instagram because, again, it's all good content. I'm enjoying it. Um, it's really good. So, uh, and I'll, ta- I'll tag Andy in it. Um, you can find me at Secret Balls on Facebook or at Dan underscore Balls on Twitter, Spider Dan Secret Balls on Instagram. And don't forget to use the hashtag Prepare for Prattle when you interact. For everything else you need to know about the podcast, swing over to Spider Dan and the Secret Balls.com on the World Wide Web to email me, read reviews, and learn how you can support the podcast. Speaking of supporting the podcast, I'd like to thank my patrons on Patreon. I am Jack's Musings, Paul Meller, Max Byrne, Tony Farina, and Scott Hodgson. Thank you for continuing to donate. It is very much appreciated and helps Prattle World keep on turning. So thank you very much, guys. And thank you, Andy. This has been great. So uh, <laughs> so I'm going to sign what, what up. What are we going to do next? What are we going to do next? Can don't you- worry. Don't worry. I've got, we've got Samurai Month coming up and we're going to actually look at some good oh, films. Oh, yeah. Yes. Ah. So that I'll make up for this. We'll make, I promise I'll make up for this. So. I hope so.